Welcome to Business Innovators Radio, featuring industry influencers and trendsetters sharing proven strategies to help you build a better life right now. We're so excited today. We've got a great guest, Brian Felkow, and he is an international speaker, and he's also a businessman here in Houston. He owns the company called Jetco. Uh, he's spoken to tens of thousands of people and around the world on the importance of establishing a healthy safety culture and how to create one. And his book is Driving to Perfection and Achieving Business Excellence by Creating a Vibrant Company Culture. And he published that through Two Harbors Press. Brian is also a regular contributor to Entrepreneur.com and The Street, and he's appeared on numerous radio programs to discuss safety culture and high-consequence industries. So we're real excited to have you to here today, Brian, so welcome to the show. Thanks. I really appreciate it, Tracy. You're welcome. So let's get right into it. Tell us about what it is that you do and, and what types of clients that you help. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, as my, my, my book, Driving to Perfection, was, is targeted at companies that want to take their business culture, whether it's a general culture or whether it's, specific, whether it's maybe more safety specific to a new level, but they need the tools. They need to figure out how to start. And there's a lot of good books and there's a lot of good material out there on business culture, but most of the material doesn't have enough of the how-to. How do I start? What do I do? What are some very low cost, high value ideas that you can take, not in six months from now, but today, this very minute, to start to change your, your business's culture for the, for the better? And you've got to remember that you know, business culture is a bottom line strategic decision. It doesn't just happen. It happens only with uh, leadership uh, determination and vision to create the culture. And what I'm doing with my clients is giving them uh, the tools to create, to create just that culture. What specific company or clients do you help? Is it a, a wide range or is it specifically uh, a certain type of industry? No, it's, it's a wide range. I've, I've worked with um, large resort organizations. I've worked with insurance companies obviously a lot in uh, transportation and in related fields. Anybody that, that wants to take their culture to a new level, what I look for uh, when I accept a client is the, is the commitment to do it. Somebody that you know, may not need and, and probably doesn't want to bring in you know, a permanent consultant, right? Somebody that just wants the tools wants to know how and has that commitment. The kind of work that I won't accept is where, you know, people, where, where you have, you know, there's certain people that, you know, think the culture is feel good stuff. They're not committed and, and maybe they're doing it just to overcome a certain perception in their company. That, that's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for people that, that are committed and just need a running start uh, and can, can kind of take it from there uh, with, with their own leadership team. That, that's where I have the most fun because those are the people that I can touch base with six months, 12 months later, and they can say, yeah, we really use these ideas to change the company, and here's how. And, and that's when I know that I've, I've helped make an impact. Perfect. So what led you to this field, and how did you get started in this business? Well, I think what's, what's exciting about this business is that, it, for me, it really grew out of my primary business. If I, if I trace my career back, I started practicing uh, corporate law, uh, you know, in my 20s, and then had an opportunity to um, go work uh, as the chief operating officer for my favorite client, who at the time was a large Midwestern-based cycling company. Uh, and we sold that to waste management. And, you know, I, I, I met so many great people and learned uh, a lot while I was at waste and, and then went, wound up buying my own company in Houston. So what, what I've really got is, you know, 25 years of um, operating and strategic background, 
um, I've seen the best, I've seen the worst, and I've seen everything in between, and I take good notes. <laughs> so um, that's that's kind of the background. And, you know, in the back of my mind, it was always, okay, someday I'll write a book. You know, someday, someday, someday. But what happened is in about 2011, our casualty insurance company asked me to give a presentation to their leadership group about why are our loss runs, why are our losses, and why is our experience so much below the average? And what are we doing to control our losses? And that, that was really a springboard for me. The springboard was that, um, you know, I had to put that into writing, into PowerPoint format. And it was kind of in that same how-to format, right? In other words, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to... Um, I'm not going to, I wasn't going to sit up there and just say, this is, you know, look how great we are. That's not my style. It's to say, look, here are some of the things that we did that worked. Here are some of the things that we did that didn't work. And, and that, that presentation kind of set the tone for the book and for future presentations um, and and future keynotes and client engagements. So this is kind of a long roundabout way of saying it, but, the, the, the book and my, my speaking business um, kind of happened organically. It happened um, as a result of, you know, the experience I have um, in my primary role, which is, you know, running companies. Very good. I love asking this question because I speak to a lot of, <clears throat> excuse me, entrepreneurs and business owners. Along the way, what book or person inspired you or has inspired you? Well, starting with books, um, you know, in terms of business and business culture, I'm a big fan of um, uh, Pat Lencioni's books. Uh, I particularly like his book called The Advantage because it takes a lot of his other books and summarizes them in one place. So uh, that, that that book is a huge inspiration. Another one of his books that he's just re re-releasing and retitling is called three signs of a miserable job, which I mean, the title tells it all. I, I like that book quite a bit. And then turning the clock way, way, way back. You know, when everybody thinks about Dale Carnegie, they think about the how to win friends book, which is certainly good, but the book that he wrote that's more relevant, I think for me and a lot of other people is one that's called how to stop worrying and start living. And th- that book to me is that book to me is must reading. In fact, um, uh, I just gave a copy to everybody in my whole company because you got to get yourself in in shape mentally first. And I see so many people that are just kind of consumed by fear and worry, and and they don't know how to manage it. This book from the 1940s is an easy read and a, a how-to guide. And again, I don't think you can be effective running a business or being a member of a team unless you've got your own house in order first. And so that, that book to me is a, is, is a must read for, you know, everybody starting in high school and, and, and on. As far as people that influence me, it's really my mentors. I mean, we, we can talk about different leaders, or world leaders and that kind of thing, but really it's the people that, that took time, uh, mentor me through my, uh, my career, whether that was as a young lawyer or a, um, somebody coming into the recycling business and I, was, I didn't really know anything about the business or, or running that kind of a business. And so the owners of that company took me under their wing and mentored me. Those are the people that I think are the, are the most influential to me. Um, I think if you ask anybody, you know, ask somebody who won the last five Super Bowls, they're not going to be able to answer it. Ask people that made a difference in your life and who took time to mentor you, and they're going to be able to answer it without thinking about it. So to me, the, my, the, the people that had the greatest influence in my life, um, in addition to my family, are you know, the, the mentors uh, took time to, to give me the tools that I needed to be successful in my career. Excellent. Thanks for sharing that with us. And it, there was a key point there about my mentors and how important that is to have mentors in business. So I appreciate you sharing that with us. You know, I've had the privilege to see you speak and and we've talked briefly, but, and I see your passion. What is it that really gives you the passion to do what you do to help the people that you help? 
the feedback I get from the audiences. The, well, for example, um, when when you were at uh, the, the event with me, I was talking about the importance of building an internal brand, that being equally as important as building an external brand. You know, the internal brand <clears throat> is your rallying cry to your uh, your internal constituents, your employees. And if you remember, there was one guy in the audience who was working on a complicated project and he had, he had kind of a, a lights on moment <laughs> mm. and he, he on the spot, he came up with an internal brand that his team could rally around to get momentum behind his project. And when I see those lights on moments, that keeps me going. Um, I was uh, speaking in Idaho last summer and um, somebody came up to me and, and said, you know, this is the second time I've heard you. I was, uh, I was glad he came back for more, but he said, I wanted to share something with you. And here's what he said. You talked about people coveting that which they can't buy. In other words, you talked about people needing things that don't have a monetary sign attached to them. And in this case, it was appreciation. And what this gentleman said is, I've always appreciated my team and my employees, but I've never really shown it. And I told them I could relate to that because I'm much the same way. You know, I come in, I'm ready to go to work. And um, he said he made a deliberate attempt to change his style to create a culture of um, appreciation. And that, that 10 minutes a day where he starts his morning or ends his day by just appreciating people for a job well done or appreciating people maybe for accomplishing a milestone, he said it turned his company around. Just because he appreciated his team doesn't mean they knew they were appreciated. And, and he said that the morale has changed. And he also said that's kind of nice that appreciation flows in a two-way direction. He's, he's getting appreciation from his team. So those are just a couple of stories that, that tell me that the program works. The program takes time, not money. Uh, and that, that in a 90-minute presentation or a day-long workshop, we can really dramatically move the needle. And as, as long as I'm able to do that uh, and obviously balance it with my uh, running my company, I'm going to keep doing it. That's great. Thanks for sharing that with us. The most common obstacle that you're finding that's preventing these companies to move the needle, so to speak, for their cultures what is that? What is that biggest obstacle? Sure. Well, let me give you a couple different uh, obstacles that I see are very common. First, and this is the obstacle that I simply cannot help an organization get over, and that's lack of leadership, passion, or drive for the culture. If, if that's not there, it's, it's, it's really not worth going much further. But no matter what the state of a company's culture is good and you want to become great poor and you want to become better if the leadership passion is there there's nothing absolutely nothing that cannot be overcome um, so first thing is we need leadership commitment that's that's the ticket to entry once we have leadership commitment the, the next obstacle is you know kind of killing the sacred cows throwing away things that may be ingrained in the company's DNA um, that are actually taking away from the culture. To me, the best example of that is a lack of involvement or empowerment of frontline employees. That's a killer because culture is a two-way dance. It's got to be leader-driven. But if it's leader-driven and not employee-owned, you're not going to succeed. Culture has to be leader-driven and employee-owned. So the, the culture has to be anchored among the employees. And I think in, in driving the perfection, I spend a lot of time on how to anchor your culture because I think that's the critical thing that we miss is this doesn't get fixed in the boardroom. This doesn't get implemented in the boardroom. Yes, the commitment and drive need to start in the boardroom. But after that, this is a frontline enterprise-wide affair. This is not a leadership-owned uh, uh, affair. So a huge barrier, in my opinion, 
whether we're talking about general company culture or specific safety culture, is a failure to connect the goals and the values and the vision of the culture with the people that have to live it, own it, and breathe it, namely your front lines. That's, that's, a, that's an area where I, I can help people tremendously in, you know, uh, eat as, as little as a, a half a day seminar, or I mean, I mean, I mean a half a day workshop. Did that uh, in October in, in New Zealand and people walked out with all sorts of ideas uh, in, in various companies. It wasn't a, a homogenous group. It was a group of people from all sorts of different companies. But you know what? The issues and the barriers are the same. It doesn't matter the company. And that's what we try and do is unlock the potential that's already there inside the company. That's a great point. It's common across the board. It doesn't matter exactly what the company is, but there's still the same challenges. Can you talk about how you've actually helped someone overcome those obstacles? So let me give you a couple of examples. Um, what, what, one, one example uh, recently is um, we did a workshop for a um, very large transportation company. The, the workshop was really geared uh, toward changing behaviors at the very front line. And what we had to do was first get the leadership team together and create vision and buy-in among the leadership team and then develop a plan to deliver the message to the front lines, not in kind of a one-time way, but in in an everyday way. So we we kind of did a deep dive on the status quo, what's working, what's not working. Uh, This company was hardly broken. It was a very healthy company, but they, they wanted to raise the bar on themselves. So what's working, what's not working? And then... Working with the leadership team, we developed a simple set of uh, items that we were going to execute on. You know, if you, if you identify too many, it's not workable. So we, we had to kind of um, separate the, the, the good ideas from the really great ideas and focus on the really great ideas. Then we developed a plan with deadlines and with accountability to, to uh, weave the plan into uh, the, the company's DNA. And in this case, what it involved a lot of it, a lot of it involved bringing your front lines in, you know, creating uh, an opportunity for front lines to come in to the governance and operation of the company, so that their voice is heard on the front end, not the back end. Just a change like that is so fundamental and so dynamic for a company's health. It, it was a foreign concept to a lot of people. What do you mean, bring the front lines in, into the operation. And, you know, it's exactly what I mean is, is quit making decisions around them, involve them in the decisions, and guess what? They're going to own the decisions. So this is an example of where we kind of diagnosed the problem, uh, which was, you know, engagement, right? And then we developed a series of uh, easy, low-cost steps, and this is critical, things that they can do on their own. See, my, my, my goal is not to become, um, my, my business model is not to become kind of an ongoing paid consultant, you know, where I'm in there, you know, every month. It's to give people the tools and make them realize that they, all that they need is to get started, maybe have some periodic check-ins, but they've got the tools to do this themselves. And it's, a, it's much better when it's done organically. So that's one example. Now, another example where we didn't have anywhere near the time to uh, get everybody to, to do as much work as I, I suggested there. Another example is I did a, it was a two hour presentation and workshop for a, a, a large resort company, a large you know, evaporate, evaporate resorts. And what they were trying to do was, um, you know, increase the quality of their service and increase, you know, de- decrease any sort of safety incidents. So what we did there in very, very rapid fire, we had 400 people in the room, uh, is we, the, the, the keynote was an opportunity to get some ideas on the table that, you know, based on the homework I had done before, I knew would resonate particularly well with this group. And the rest of the time was people working in groups of, you know, eight or 10 on, on assignments that we gave them, questions that we asked with, with plenty of time to report out. So... 
we did it in rapid fire. And, and after that two hour period, each person walked away with an I will, you know, a commitment. I will do this. I will do this. Create the change that this company desired. So this can happen a number of different ways. It can happen in a couple hour presentation uh, to a large group. It can also happen in a more intimate company specific uh, a series of meetings. But again, at the end of the day, the message has to be the same. You've known what to do all along. You needed me to get you just thinking about it and focused on it. You've got the tools. Now now go make it happen. Excellent examples. Thank you. Sure. What's the what would be the first thing that the listener or the reader should do if they're ready to take that step to change that culture? Well, I think the first thing is um, even though even though the listener or the reader says they're ready, they've got to look in the mirror and they be, they've got to be sure they're really ready. How many times have we seen people? We, and look, <laughs> we see this all the time where a, a business president or a business owner hires somebody to uh, succeed him. In other words, okay, I'm going to I'm going to hire somebody to run the company. I'm going to go do other things. Well. I do believe they mean that, but then how many times do we see it where they're always undermining that person or they, they really can't let go or they never really wanted to let go. So the first thing you got to do is be sure that you're really ready. And then, you know, rarely do we see a situation that's completely broken. So, you know, take your company and, 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 Look at the look at the pros and the cons um, of what's going on in your company's culture, and let's just take a step back and define culture for a minute. It's simply people and process working in harmony. So, you know, do we have the right people in in the right positions? Do they all share our values? I mean, if we're just getting started, do they even know what our values are? Um, and then the same question about processes. Are our processes well understood? Because uh, as an organization, as a company, it's our responsibility to communicate our processes with uh, our, our team. I mean, you can't hold an individual accountable for not knowing what they're supposed to do. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. So, um, you know, you do, do, do a quick audit, a quick overview of your people and your processes. And you've got to make some, some commitments up front that, that things are going to change. You're going to have people, some very good people technically, who are going to resist that change. Mm -hmm. And they either need to come on board for the future or ultimately they can't work at the company because, because your team members need to behave in alignment with one another and, and in alignment with your values. And if, if, if somebody can't do that, they're going to ultimately undermine your mission. So just come to terms with the fact that you're going to have some people working against you. And they may not be the people uh, that you would expect to be working against you, but they don't like change. So be empathetic, anticipate how you're going to handle change, and be sure you're, you know what you're going to do to manage the change so that it's not scary. But the people that can't get on board after that transition process, after being given a chance and, and coaching, um, probably can't be on the team. So those are a couple of things I would kind of do mentally before I get start, before I even got started. Is mentally, I need to be sure that I, as the leader, am really ready to do this. And I'm not just kind of you know thinking, well, this would be a nice idea, because this is a 24/7 commitment, and ultimately, as the leader, you are the embodiment of the culture. You've got to be sure that 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 you're ready for the change, that your behaviors and your actions line up with the culture, then once you're ready, then, you know, what I did, for example, is, is, is I, I looked at companies that um, I admired from the outside. And I told some of those stories in driving to perfection. But look at companies you admire. Look at companies whose service is exemplary, whose employees are empowered, uh, who don't have to compete as much on price because they bring something different to the table. Look at those people operating in commoditized industries who can still bring uh, more value to the table and ask what, what, what's different about them, right? The companies that I admired and wrote about in Driving to Perfection 
may be totally different than the companies that somebody else admires, but ask about the why. In other words, look outside in order to get yourself centered on the inside and get out of your industry. I mean, it's okay to look at competitors and admire what they're doing, but look at companies that have nothing to do with your industry because best practices are best practices. It doesn't matter the industry. So, so get out of the bubble and, and cast a wide net. Um, and then once you've done that, once you're really ready, you know, again, like we talked about earlier, there's good books out there. Uh, there's there's some, some, some great authors uh, that, that can get you started. And otherwise, you jump in. You jump in with your leadership team, and you make clear where the company is going, uh, and you let your leadership team develop the course with you. You don't dictate the course. You, you set the big direction, and your leadership team has to be uh, involved with how we get there. And then, you know, and then, again, the key is once you're ready, this is an enterprise-wide event. So we don't get on the plane and go to some warm destination for a meeting. We do it right there with our front line. And, and we, we be sure that everybody uh, is involved. And again, that's the anchoring process. So to get started, you kind of have to, you have to begin with the end in mind and kind of sequence out, how am I going to get there? And, and that's where I can, you know, I, and can, I'm not really trying to promote um, uh, myself, there's other people that, that, that can do this too, but, but maybe getting some outside resources in at the early stages of execution can help. And if you don't need it, you think you can do it on your own, again, that's exactly why um, driving to perfection exists is because if you can do it on your own, do it. And, and again, the more organic it is and the more homegrown it is, the better. That's uh, great advice. So if somebody, if the reader is ready to get started, how can they contact you and get more information? Well, uh, we'll start a couple places. First of all, um, my email address is Brian, B-R-I-A-N, at Brian Filco, B-R-I-A-N, F-I-E-L-K-O-W.com. Uh, the website is brianfilco.com. I'm also active on uh, uh, LinkedIn, and uh, uh, I've got a, a business page on Facebook, too, but uh, it's, it, I'm, I'm glad to kind of have discussions with people or, or email ideas. My website has a lot of resources to get people started, various articles and, and things that you, know, you can download um, without cost. And people that pick up Driving to Perfection in the past have emailed me and have uh, um, asked for a little more information or you know, saying, well, I didn't quite understand what this meant. I'm glad to do that. And, also, um, if, they, if somebody's interested in booking me for a presentation, either a keynote or a workshop, contacting me through that email address is the best way to do that. Um, and, and my phone number also is 713-676-1111. And if I'm not around, um, just asking for Jamie or Lisa will get you to the right spot. I know you have your book published, but you're in the process of publishing a new book. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, right now I'm working on actually two books. Um, the first book is going to, is the, the next book is going to be called Leading People Safely, How to Win in the Business Battlefield. And it's a, it's a huge privilege to co-author that book with uh, Jim Schultz, who's a friend and, and a mentor. And I expect that book to be out um, sometime in the middle of 2016. It's going to be a book that's focused on safety culture, but when you read it, you're going to see that the concepts apply to pretty much any aspect of culture. We're just focusing on safety, but a safety culture, a healthy safety culture, simply cannot exist in an unhealthy business culture. So it's, it's very related, but it's more safety specific. And then, then the book I'm working on that will follow that up is going to be a, a kind of a sequel to Driving to Perfection with more of those practical hands-on tools uh, to build your business culture. And that, that book is called 50, 50 Tools, um, I'm sorry, the working title is 50 Ways to Ignite Your Business Culture. And it will just take the driving to perfection concepts and um, add new depth and new ideas to what we've already established. And, you know, the, those new ideas always come from the fact that you never stop learning. So, what I was able to share in 2012, early 2013, 
I was writing Driving to Perfection. Well, it's changed over the past three or four years. So it's time for a new book. So we've got two things that are um, uh, very much in development. And, and the safety, the Leading People Safely book will, will be out first. Well, we appreciate your time, sir. And thank you for all the golden nuggets about creating a culture. And we look forward to your upcoming books. And looking forward to hear more great things from you. So thank you very much for being on the show today. Thank you, Tracy. I really appreciate it. Well, there you have it. We'll see you the next time. Thanks for listening to Business Innovators Radio. To hear all episodes featuring leading industry influencers and trendsetters, visit us online at businessinnovatorsradio.com today.